attending this tutorial on management of brain injury. My name is uh, Maurod, I'm from Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. I work in a general intensive care and uh, we care quite a lot of uh, brain injured patients. Uh, So we, we try and, and do an interactive session. Of course, the, the, the thematic is... Uh, okay. Right. The thematic is quite vast. Uh, and so, of course, you have to try and select uh, the main uh, uh, issues here. So I will uh, uh, go uh, systematically with the initial approach to the comatose patient and what I call the basic or fundamental triad, which is the neurological examination, neuroimaging and neuromonitoring. Uh, discuss a little bit uh, what uh, you have to think about and how to manage secondary cerebral damage and also the potential uh, side effects and how to manage systemic injury. Uh, the approach to the comatose patient, whatever cause, uh, whether this is primary or secondary, I will mainly concentrate on the management of primary acute brain injury, whether this is traumatic, uh, hemorrhagic, ischemic, it's based on the neuro examination, uh, fundamentally uh, the glass glaucoma scale. Uh, you can add to the glass glaucoma scale uh, the, all the brainstem reflexes, so it becomes the four score for the full uh, outline of uh, uh, responsiveness, which has been especially uh, characterized uh, for outcome uh, prognostication in patients with cardiac arrest. And uh, the brainstem reflexes is uh, very important to assess pupillary size, pupillary reactivity, and function. The Number two is neuroimaging. You have to know, uh, especially uh, the brain head CT scan. If uh, there are focal signs, you may want, of course, to perform um, a CT scan. A CT scan is very good, especially for all what is uh, hemorrhage. And then the third point is uh, neuromonitoring, which modality, it's uh, highly dependent on, of course, the etiology uh, of uh, brain injury. So we cannot cover all the spectrum in a little bit more than 25 minutes. I will refer to this uh, consensus paper that uh, revises uh, all the important uh, issues related to neurological examination, starting again with the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, with brainstem reflexes, and then adding on top imaging, uh, neuromonitoring, whether this is invasive or non-invasive. So in this paper, you will find uh, algorithms that, go back again, that describe uh, how to uh, approach the patients, but please start always with neurological examination at the beginning and then uh, in the follow-up. <laughs> Neuroimaging is uh, uh, the parallel second uh, fundamental point. So it depends again on, on the cause. Uh, obviously, if you have a, a brain trauma or if you have a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, ischemia, you have to follow up patients for uh, evolving intracerebral lesions. And of course, uh, if you have a, a TBI, this can be a subdural hematoma that can be evacuated or must be evacuated, uh, a contusion. If you have ischemia, whether this uh, may uh, uh, progress into malignant edema, intracerebral hemorrhage, again the same. So head CT scan is the first set. Now, in many centers, MRI is available. MRI imaging uh, 
is becoming more popular for the assessment, especially angio MRI in patients with acute ischemic stroke. Uh, at our center, we perform more uh, uh, MRI nowadays. We used to perform CT scan and CT perfusion to assess ischemic penumbra and so to assess the potential for reperfusion and with uh, the endovascular therapy, MRI is uh, increasingly used. If uh, you are dealing with trauma, uh, with uh, hemorrhage, of course, it's the number one is a uh, head CT scan. And then if you're dealing with a patient with uh, secondary brain injury, uh, admitted for other reasons, can be for uh, heart surgery, can be for a severe infection, you uh, may want to uh, uh, go and perform a CT scan or even MRI to exclude uh, secondary lesions, especially in the presence of focal uh, um, signs. Now, I put this uh, uh, paper, uh, in which is a summary published in Lancet Neurology, uh, and it's uh, the example, it's based on severe traumatic brain injury, how a CT scan uh, helps you in categorizing the type of uh, trauma you have and uh, obviously what uh, the CT scan uh, helps you in, 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 in guiding with the therapy and also potentially with the monitoring is the risk that the patients may evolve in having intracranial pressure and intracranial hypertension. So this kind of CT scan, of course, you don't want to uh, uh, wait too long uh, to uh, evacuate this lesion. Uh, if you have this kind of lesion, the, the, the risk of intracranial hypertension is low. Uh, whilst if you have intracerebral lesions like hematoma or contusions, these are uh, prone to uh, uh, have intracranial hypertension. So the risk of elevated ICP is high in both uh, these situations. So again, a CT scan uh, is essential to uh, guide the management of these patients. Uh, now, if you have a, a prior, primary brain injury which uh, is uh, of uh, uh, the ischemic type, uh, ruptured aneurysm in this example, uh, well, you have to know not only the CT scan but also CT angiography. And this is an example of a patient at day five, uh, admitted with a ruptured aneurysm, subarachnoid hemorrhage, poor grade patient, and the combination of uh, imaging and monitoring uh, trigger uh, this examination. And then after this examination, you will do an intervention because this is a, a, a vasospasm which was coupled with a, a neurological uh, deterioration, but especially uh, deterioration in terms of monitoring. So this uh, is a delayed cerebral ischemia and needs intervention. Uh, and you, you see here uh, the combination of the uh, CT angiography and CT perfusion, where you have uh, and you see uh, uh, the infarct zone, but around this zone you have a, a zone of penumbra, where you have a, a vasodilation and you have an increase in the mean transit time, so this is a classic ischemic penumbra, and you uh, uh, may uh, intervene on this patient by raising uh, blood pressure and uh, optimizing brain perfusion and avoiding uh, uh, additional tissue uh, loss, which can be obviously detrimental in terms of outcome. Uh, this is another example of uh, the way uh, you uh, need to know uh, imaging uh, very well for the management of this patient. And then uh, monitoring. You have a lot of tools. Uh, on the upper part is the invasive uh, neuromonitoring and especially the combination of the two, intracranial pressure and brain tissue oxygen, for optimizing uh, brain circulation, so the treatment of elevated ICP, optimization of brain perfusion with brain oxygen, uh, this optimization of brain circulation, you can uh, also follow up transcranial Doppler. And then you have the evaluation of brain function with EEG and new uh, tools like infrared pupillometry, I will come back later. 
near infrared spectroscopy, at least in my center, we predominantly use this uh, uh, near infrared spectroscopy for uh, the follow up of patients with venous arterial ECMO. So, if I want to summarize, uh, we regularly use uh, and, and we have protocols and algorithms for the management of severe traumatic brain injury and severe intracranial hemorrhage, ICH or SIH. We use the combination of ICP and brain oxygen to adjust uh, the management, especially uh, therapy of intracranial hypertension and management and optimization of brain perfusion. This we do in combination with transcranial Doppler, regular transcranial Doppler, to see brain compliance and obviously to follow up uh, ischemia in patients with severe SIH. Uh, the EEG is used at our center to rule out uh, seizures. We don't use a systematic uh, anti-epileptic prophylaxis. And, uh, to uh, prognosticate patients, especially those with brain injury after cardiac arrest. The infrared pupillometry has become popular in, in our center for the follow-up, the neurological follow-up, so the pupillary follow-up in patients with severe brain injuries. So we do it uh, at the same time that the standard examination uh, and we follow up pupil size both eyes and pupil reactivity <coughs> and an index which is called neurological pupil index. And the NIRS, uh, we only use it essentially in patients with venous arterial ECMO because we have seen patients with a problem with circulation and potential cerebral desaturation. So if you have a problem with macro circulation, the NIRS can capture it. It's never a tool that will replace uh, intracranial invasive brain tissue oxygen. So to make sure this point, you cannot detect brain hypoxia, but you can detect locally, but you can detect if you have brain hypoperfusion. So we have two patients with severe cerebral venous thrombosis and patients uh, on venous arterial ECMO where the NIRS actually detected hypoperfusion and triggered an intervention. I could discuss uh, for hours about monitoring, but this is the way we use it at our center. Now, uh, what about ICP monitoring? So this is a survey, and the answer is that the, those replying to the survey think that the ICP monitoring should be used in all severe TBI patients with Glasgow below 8 and CT abnormalities. And I hope that the, what the physicians think is also the practice. We will have data from the center TBI on what is the prevalence of IC, ICP monitoring utilization. But I give you just an example of a, a young TBI patient, an accident, bike versus car, uh, low Glasgow, pupils reactive and symmetrical that was presented yesterday uh, uh, for a clinical vignette. And when you have these kind of patients, uh, young patients with clear intracerebral lesions and clear signs of uh, cerebral edema, our, uh, uh, at our center, we use invasive ICP monitoring and we tend not to wake up this patient and to follow ICP. And based on recent recommendations, we always insert ICP in combination with uh, uh, local brain tissue oxygenation. Uh, we perform regular Doppler, as I told you, so I, I, I refer to this paper, and, and what is very important for transcranial Doppler, for the follow-up of uh, intracranial hypertension and problems with brain compliance, <coughs> is uh, the pulsatility index, so you have, when you have problems with circulation, increase in pressure, the diastolic velocities are lower, and this will raise uh, the pulsatility index. So this is uh, the normal, and this is the pathological. Now this is useful for follow-up of cerebral circulation, and it's of course also useful uh, for the follow-up of secondary ischemia. But so if you have a high ICP in the 2025, 
we also combine the ICP with brain oxygen and with transcranial Doppler to adjust the intensity of therapy. And so you, you can use these modalities, ICP, brain oxygen, Doppler, more complex issues I will not to discuss, like assessing the <laughs> regulation. But if you have the ICP, the ICP curve, the aspect of the ICP curve, in combination of Doppler, you can assess compliance, and then you have brain tissue oxygen, you have a, a broad view of circulation, whether you need to treat ICP, maybe more aggressively because there is a problem with circulation, or you can adjust CPP to higher levels based on problems uh, uh, with brain oxygen. And also importantly, you adjust mechanical ventilation to avoid uh, secondary ischemia because you reduce uh, CO2 too much or you have uh, a PCO2 of 40 with an ICP of 25 and you can actually uh, reduce CO2, moderate hyperventilation to uh, reduce ICP. Okay, some uh, questions. So this is the complex way we monitor, uh, we, we, sorry, we treat ICP. And this is uh, the most recent algorithm, and then you say, okay, but is barbiturates evidence-based? Is hypothermia evidence-based? Is the compressive craniectomy something that we want to do? So in the end, uh, all these treatments are highly controversial. Not to mention the fact that we use osmotherapy regularly, but if I ask you, whether you prefer mannitol, whether you prefer hypertonic saline. The question is, we don't really know what is best. Probably we use more hypertonic saline than mannitol, but based on a large consensus, a systematic review, what we can only say is that these hypertonic fluids are effective in reducing ICP, but that there is no evidence that one is superior to another. But if you treat intracranial hypertension, there is no evidence that prophylactic treatment works. And if you do it, you have to monitor ICP. So you cannot treat uh, uh, high blood pressure, so systemic hypertension without knowing blood pressure. The same applies for ICP. So I think these uh, agents are effective, and if you use it, we need to control uh, ICP and monitor ICP. Uh, as for volume, we have to apply the same criteria in these patients than in generalized U patients. So uh, avoid hypovolemia, forget hypervolemia, hypervolemic uh, therapy, uh, even triple. Triple H uh, has been abandoned, and so adjust uh, hemodynamics and keep uh, euvolemia and avoid excessive amount of fluids in these patients. And the fundamentals is to keep normal sodium and osmolarity, even slightly higher if you have problem with edema, avoid hypotonic fluids, and use always isotonic fluids, or you may want to add a little bit of hypertonic, especially if you have low sodium, below 140 or low osmolarity. And so I think that, the, sorry, the, the level used, these are recommendations. If you have a patient with a problem with intracranial hypertension, you may want to be rather in 150, 310, so being slightly hypernatremic and uh, hyper or smaller than the opposite. Uh, I remember a patient with elevated ICP having a sodium of 138. We added hypertonic uh, solutions to elevate uh, uh, sodium and osmolarity. So these are basic principles. As it's the case that you have to control fever, especially in patients with severe brain injury, and in those at risk of uh, intracranial hypertension. And this large uh, data set, uh, the only group of patients in, in which fever control is, was beneficial uh, is the patients with acute brain pathologies. 
have the question is, is which level and I don't really have a, a, a definitive question but what we do at our center in cardiac arrest we use control normothermia or slightly hypothermia 35-36 uh, and in patients with uh, uh, intracranial lesions uh, with TBI or subarachnoid hemorrhage we start with fever control and if we have a, a, an issue with ICP we target the therapy to try and control ICP uh, in between 35 and 36 and we don't use uh, mild hypothermia in uh, none of the patients uh, uh, with uh, brain injury. So it's a relatively not too aggressive strategy. And fever control for everyone with severe brain injury. So going back to this previous uh, guy, this was the CT scan at day four. You see the uh, intracranial pressure with brain tissue <laughs> oxygen. And uh, the question is, okay, what do you do? Do you decompress this patient? Do you increase barbiturate coma? Do you increase or, or be more aggressive with hypothermia? What give that gave us the answer was the poor compliance and very pathological transcranial Doppler at this stage. So with these neuroimaging, even if the ICP was kept at 2025, which you can consider okay, the addition of this uh, CT scan plus this uh, uh, pathological, highly pathological transcranial Doppler triggered the intervention, and so we used the compressive craniectomy in this patient. So this gives you the answer that you need to individualize care based on the different modality you use and based on pathophysiology. There is a very nice uh, review by Martin Smith uh, on how uh, you can use what is the role of the compressive craniectomy in traumatic brain injury also in ischemic stroke. So based on the evidence you should abandon, but I think with, that in many patients there is still a role for the compressive craniectomy. Uh, just a word about the, the, the monitoring of brain function. We combine uh, frequently the neurological examination with the quantitative assessment in terms of EEG, in terms of pupillometry, uh, and especially because we now have a modern uh, EEG approach that gives you not only the standard view but also the quantitative view, so you can really uh, use uh, and spare time especially for the neurologist and I just wanted to show you this uh, study uh, and I, I really uh, encourage you of, uh, of uh, reading this paper because it's an analysis of a lot of patients and they give you a sort of message so which patients you need to monitor if a patient is not comatose, doesn't have history of seizure and no EEG risk factors, a short EEG is enough. And then when the risk increases, let's say that only in patients at high risk, a continuous monitoring may be indicated or of course those with status epilepticus. But with new EEG and new data, let's say that very often, to rule out seizures, an intermittent EG, maybe 60, up to two, uh, 60 minutes up to two hours is enough. And the continuous EG monitoring is essentially required when you treat status epilepticus and especially refractory status epilepticus. So I think that improvement in, in the EG interface is something that is nowadays very helpful and so many more of these patients may have EEG. There are also review uh, in terms of the new uh, agents available to treat seizures that I recommend you. Uh, we have uh, five minutes left, so I think I will go a bit quickly and tell you the following is that we have uh, to abandon based on the frustration we have uh, in terms of randomized controlled trials. So I have here 
a slide of all the trials which are either equal or negative, but we still need to treat these patients. So my uh, view and the modern view is to individualize therapy based on the pathophysiology. So I think we can just open the discussion and, uh, and you have questions on the different uh, topics that I touched and of course with 25 minutes you have to select. So if I forgot something or if you want to discuss something, please, this is the time. Mauro, I have two questions to TCD. Do you, have, do you use continuous or intermittent? And when, Sorry, do, could you repeat? TCD. Yeah, transcranial doctor. Yeah, yes. Do you use continuous or intermittent? Intermittent. And how often? Depends on the, on the patient. Uh, so in, in TDI <coughs> patients, we generally do twice a day. Um, so morning and afternoon. Uh, I, I think, I mean, inside, inside our unit, we have uh, uh, trained uh, physicians to approach the transcranial Doppler in terms of assessing the velocities and the pulsatility index. When it comes to delayed cerebral ischemia, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, we have a good relationship with the neurologists. And so the neurologists perform daily ECD assessments in the high risk patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And to the temperature management, which temperature? Uh, is it the brain temperature? Or, because you know, it is many studies yeah, yes. and not written which. Pain. So we use a, a bladder temperature. Uh, so we use uh, the urinary catheter. Now, more recently, we have uh, the system with brain oxygen combined with brain temperature. And you see the temperature in the brain when you have fever is always higher, one degree. Uh, so <clears throat> if there is a problem with ICP, I tend to have at least a brain temperature below 37, which in general is a temperature of 36. But the, the temperature in our unit is either bladder temperature or core temperature using uh, the, the thermistor, either you use PICO or use a Swangans catheter. Now, more recently, we have the brain temperature. I, I, I have questions from the fellows. Well, the temperature in the brain is 37.8, in the blood is 36.9, so what should we do? Uh, if a patient doesn't have big problems. I don't think that we need to be too aggressive with temperature if ICP is okay. If you have a patient with SAH, it may just be a sign that there is a risk for delayed ischemia. So it's bladder or core. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Brain is hot. Uh, question. Do you use pressure reactivity index in the treatment of your patients? No. Pressure reactivity index is what I I shown before. Uh, so we, you, we, we assess autoregulation at the bedside by looking at the behavior. And maybe uh, let's try and go back. Sorry, don't become epileptic. Um, so the question is, look at the relationship between ICP and MAP. So generally, if you have a high potential, the blood pressure decreases, ICP goes up. So if you increase CPP, blood pressure and CPP, ICP goes down. This is a preserved autoregulation, so meaning that there is an inverse relationship between these two variables. So this is a good test at the bedside. If you raise CPP and ICP uh, goes down, it means that the patient has a preserved autoregulation. And in this young fellow before, we raised CPP in between 70 and 80. The opposite, where you have a passive uh, uh, behavior, means that uh, you raise blood pressure and you see ICP going up. In this patient, you must be careful with vasopressors because you can even increase edema. But this is done at the bedside. But we don't have uh, 
the device that you can add on the monitor to assess PRX, which is the pressure reactivity index. So basically, online correlation between these two. We don't use it. Uh, there are <coughs> many studies, predominantly coming from one center, I should say. Uh, we don't use it. Okay. And we use. You 